Today on Rambling About Cars, we have debuts coming out of our bottom. New York Auto Show has been a big thing. We've got BMW 7 Series, i7, Ferrari 296, Lexus RZ, Mercedes EQS SUV, Subaru Outback, Hyundai, Jeep. Whew. And you're going to want to hang out for the end because we have a very, very cool off-road drag race that you absolutely have to see. So without further ado, it is podcast time. I'm Christopher Smith, and I toss it across the way to Chris Bruce. Bruce, tell us who we have with us here today. Sure thing. We've got Brandon Turkus with us. He was at the aforementioned Desert Drag Race and was also mm. a participant in it. So he will be telling us all about that in the second half of the show. And we also have Seth Mearsmo with us. And Seth, you, you had a critique of last week's episode, I think. Go ahead. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're to- right. You're totally right. valid. Totally valid. Totally valid. Yes. Yeah. So, so I uh, listen, as all of you do, to the podcast, and I caught the, um, I think, very well-intentioned, um, uh, we, had a, we had a reader, uh, sorry, we had a, we had a listener watcher email uh, about a conspiracy theory, and you guys had a really good time talking about the compa- conspiracy theory, which was essentially that because of Toyota and Subaru's involvement, that perhaps Subaru was, uh, had, had, had cut the, the upcoming STI beca- to make room for the Toyota's GR Corolla, right? And I actually, like, I agree. It was really fun. It was a fun conversation. I think you guys did it, you know, did right by the listeners by with it. I will only say that Motor One as an organization, so I'm the editor in chief. I'm the one who has to be sort of uh, the bad guy in a lot of cases. I just want to be very clear. We have zero actual information that that rumor is true. Like, we don't want to. We don't want to purport things that are that are not true. So. Um, uh, Mr. Bruce and Mr. Smith got a, a little bit of a conversation with me after we had that, uh, after that podcast, just simply to say like, um, w- you know, again, I'm the fun police. They're having fun there. You, you guys, you, you guys are talking about uh, what the internet wants to hear. And I'm here to say like, uh, interesting story, zero to back it up. Highly unlikely that any of it is actually relevant. Yes. Readers or watchers, uh, <laughs> viewers and listeners, please still write in. Tell me why I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, you, you can, we can we can deal with all of that. Right. But I just really, Rika, uh, thanks for getting us in trouble. <laughs> Yes, Podcast yes, at yes, motor yes. one.com is the email. No, no, Seth is absolutely That's right. right. Yes. Has has motor one? Um, yeah, absolutely nothing to that. It is what it is, but Seth, we really appreciate the feedback. We appreciate you coming on, but you're really on. I, li- right, right, yeah, <laughs> right now, the listeners are like, Oh, geez, they got the editor in chief on, they must have really screwed up. No, 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 no. Seth is really on because he was at the New York Auto Show. That's right. That is just That's wrapping right. up um, as this podcast is posting. And without many auto shows happening here in the last couple of years, um, I mean, Seth had a really great vantage point, not just of the vehicles that were there, some of the debuts, but also just kind of a lot, like a take on, on the status of auto shows in general. And we yeah. are very much looking forward to that. Um, how do we want to start this big old conversation? Because it is a big one. Well, we, well we can't, oh, go ahead, Seth. Well, all I was going to say is, like, I think it's interesting that this year, um, you know, this is the first year since 2019, correct me if I'm wrong, that we've had an auto show in New York in person uh, live, right? right. Like, correct. Um, with, with, with cars on the stage. And, um, I, you know, one thing that's very telling of the, the kind of way that this auto, the, this New York auto show went down, it was amazing that it was there, right? Amazing to be back there in person is... Usually when Motor One is covering a big auto show, we come in force, right? You know, we've got a team there creating content, interviewing people, sort of covering it live and in person and on the ground. And the fact is, I was the only one who was there, right? (laughs) And I think that's actually, in and of itself, sort of speaks volumes as to the way that both media and automakers were approaching the auto show this year, right? So there was still a lot of, there was a very high level of cautiousness about whether or not um, the, the investment, and it's a very big investment for an automaker to have a debut and a stage at an international auto show, especially in New York, whether mm-hmm. or not that investment was going to get borne out, like in the coverage that they would get in the, in the public, um, you know, uh, reception that they would get when the public show opens and things like that. So a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about, I think is really interesting, but we're going to talk about a lot of debuts that happened kind of last week. A lot of them had a physical presence in New York. 
but not all of them will be there at the Jacob Javits Center if you yeah. are in New York and you're you're walking through, right? So that in and of itself is a really, to me, like a, an interesting sort of state of the union for where kind of big uh, in person auto shows are right now, and and it'll be interesting to see where they where they net out, right? As we as we go forward, right? And that's an interesting take because BMW is among them. BMW, mm-hmm. I mean. There was the X7, and then uh, more recently, we we have the, the new 7 Series and the i7. None of those were actually physically at the New York show, correct? But they, they still had a, de- a debut in New York. Yeah, so I went to the debut program, and I guess, like, I should say this. I, I haven't been back. I don't think that they, they have... I'm I'm 98% positive that they don't have any physical presence at the show, but they didn't debut this at the show. They Mm -hmm. debuted it literally, you know, like within blocks of the Javits center in another space. Um, uh, You know, they had all the same media there. It was on day two of the, the quote unquote media days of the show, but they did their own thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And they did this. This is something that, you know, Brandon can probably speak to this. This is not like a new thing for covering auto shows. Like automakers have been looking for white space around the actual, you know, event itself for a long time. Um, But we saw a little bit more of this, this year in New York, including BMW. So, so BMW did a, a kind of morning day two launch of seven series and I seven, um, X7 was there as well. A ton of media were invited. I was there with maybe, I, I don't know, 50, 60 other journalists, including some of our friends from Inside EVs and other people that we work with as uh, freelance uh, writers and things like that. Um, so it was a big event, but it wasn't actually on the show floor. Well, let's, uh, I mean, let's dive into seven series because we talked about X7 a little bit last week. And if you didn't catch that episode, you want to go to our YouTube channel, Motor One Podcast, where you can catch last week's um, episode. You can also get us on Spotify, Google, Apple. We're on like a dozen different uh, streaming platforms. And of course, you want to go to MotorOne.com where you can read all about the X7, the new seven series, the i7. We have debut articles there. But let's talk a little bit about seven series because it has... I mean, we have to address it right up front. I mean, it has the same kind of split headlight design that the X7 has. And I think that's going to be something that people are going to be talking about. And we've had certainly had conversations in our Slack chat or sorry, Teams chat. It's been like three freaking years since we had Slack. (laughs) We've talked about it in our Teams chat. And I don't know that. I mean, this is controversial styling, but it's kind of growing on me. I mean, what, what do you guys think about that? So real quick, I think one other thing that's worth mentioning is that the 7 Series has been BMW's flagship for decades now. This is kind of the flagship BMW product. And a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times, the styling that you see on the 7 Series, the cues you see, they trickle down to the 5 Series or the 3 Series. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we don't know for certain, but this could be a preview of what BMWs look like in the future. And so that makes this all the more interesting because this has a new styling language, new design language for the company. It's um, Seth. I know we were talking about this in the Slack check that or Slack teams. The, uh, <laughs> You're not the only one or I'm not the only exactly. one. Uh, it has the super high like shoulder line. It's very flat mm-hmm. and angular. It's it's an interesting look and kind of a surprising look. So very, very high belt line on it. So and first of all, I, I think. I don't, I don't even think it's fair to say that it was maybe evenly divided. I'm curious. I don't know, Brandon, if I got your take on it, but um, here, here's my thing. I, I can see again. So what is BMW doing? BMW is doing big kidney grills. They're changing their lighting signatures for their vehicles. And they're, they've been doing this for what, three, two years now, three years now. They're doing it in a way that's causing a lot of people a lot of kind of heartburn uh, who love BMW and they expect it to, to uh, look a certain way. This is also par for the course for BMW in terms of like moving uh, their, when they change their design language, it causes a lot of enthusiasts um, pain, right? They're like, well, I like the last thing and now we're doing this new thing and I I don't really understand it and it doesn't make sense. And then it kind of reaches a point of equilibrium. And I think this is in my mind what we're looking at, right? That the seven series, where is this language a little bit better They've, they've toned it down a little bit. The car that you're flipping through right now, especially with the blacked out like front treatment, really minimizes the effect. It still is mm-hmm. quite a large grill. It's also framed in LEDs. 
Um, so it really is drawing attention to it too. They, they, they're not hiding this. They, they know what, what they're doing and they, they, um, you know, are pushing that forward. Um, I think that it's a really interesting car and kind of a complicated car, but not for the face that, that I think gets a lot of attention. I think that there are other design elements that are happening, including the eye belt line and the sort of way the shoulders fold over that are maybe not like an ideal large luxury sedan look for me, but overall the presence is huge. I think it does what a seven series is supposed to do. It kind of impresses you. It's going to look like it's, you know, 80 feet long on the street. Uh, you know what I mean? It's got a lot of presence <laughs> when you actually yeah. put it out in the real world. Oh, it does. I think that'll impress. But but I know that it's not an easy styling language to just look at and be like, beautiful, right? It's not obviously beautiful in any way outside. It's not beautiful, but I, so especially this black one. And for anyone who's watching on YouTube, I will swap over to the other gallery we have of this, which is in silver. Uh, it's specifically the i7, the electric model that we'll talk about here in a second. So you'll get to see kind of the different looks. But in black, this thing just looks so menacing and it just looks mean and menacing and angry. It looks like a car a villain would drive. And it just, I, I really like it. Um, in the other colors, you know, it's, Maybe that's going to make a difference, but I think black, it it conceals a lot of the design flourishes in a way that just makes this makes this design look better to me. Brandon, I'm really curious to hear your take on this. Yeah, I, I, I tweeted about this earlier today and, you know, shortly after the debut and. I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of apathetic to BMW design at this point. Like I, you know, they haven't done any, or they, the company hasn't done anything in the past several years that I've really been blown away by. And I'm just, I'm past the point of being annoyed or upset about it. It's just, it's just there. And no amount of rage tweeting is, is going to change that. <laughs> rage tweeting. Um, you know, I, I will say looking at it critically, I, I see a lot of two series grand coupe in the rear end, which I, I don't find, a great look. I, I'm more concerned by the split headlights, which is kind of a trendy thing from a few years ago that I, I, I thought that that trend was on its way out. Um, and I, I say this as a person that really liked the, the bangle seven series from the, from the early two thousands or mid two thousands. Um, I enjoy like that. The design. I, yeah, I do. I do. I, th and I, but more importantly, I think that design has aged beautifully. I see one on the road. And I'm, I'm, I still find it attractive today. I'm, I'm really concerned that this vehicle will not age especially well. Um, it's, it's just so trendy and in the now, like BMW. Whereas the Seven Series, when, when that one came out, it was really pushing the envelope forward. And you know, it's the the Two Series back end. It's the split headlights, which, like I said, are kind of kind of an old fashioned thing. I just I don't see it aging terribly well. But at the same time, I, I just I can't get excited about BMW design anymore. I, I understand what they're trying to do. I understand that it appeals to the Chinese market and I fully respect them, respect BMW uh, focusing on on China in this way. It's just it's, it's not doing anything for me and I'm, I'm past the point of really, you know, feeling strongly one way or the other about it. It's, it's not provocative to you anymore, in other words, like, which is no, it's, I it's not actually, that. you know, the, I was, I was actually just thinking this, the, the thing that worries me more is that it is not graceful. And mm. you look at those mm. big luxury cars. And part of the reason that, that they don't seem quite so offensive is that there's a degree of grace to them. If you see an Audi A8, like gliding down the road or an S class, it is, it is a graceful design. This is, this is brutal though. And yeah. I don't think I think that kind of exacerbates the size of the thing. And I, I think that's I why think, you guys like the black one so much is because it minimizes that. Yeah, it, it hides the things that uh, that people might find critical, right? Yeah. I, I, and I think that's a fair critique, Brandon. And actually, you know what? When when you say that, what it reminds me of is I still have this feeling about it, but I remember the overall conversation around God, it's like two generations ago now, but like two S class ago, and I don't remember the um, God. I don't remember the model designation either. But it came out. They were, it had a crazy body side for the time, like sort of flared fenders, but they were flattened out, and it was the first time that we had seen those before. 
Um, I'm talking about sort of mid, like early. This is like uh, 08, 08 to like oh, exactly, 2014, exactly. Exactly. I want to say. Yeah. So that seven series had the same thing where it went from being like slightly more elegant, still a very large car, but like um, uh, a, a simple but elegant body side into this thing that was like very multifaceted and complicated. And it just seemed like they were trying to turn it into sort of an SUV, right? Like on the, on the road. And I think people sort of matured into that, but like it, it felt, it felt really strange for a long time. And it felt like it was doing something that you didn't expect a, an S class to do at the time. I, I have that same vibe from this car a little bit, like from the exterior styling again, very imposing, menacing, big, you're wealthy. If you're driving it, like, you know, it's doing a lot of work in messaging something about the actual owner or driver or, or passenger in that case. Um, but I don't know that it's, it's something that, I don't know if we're ever going to look at it and be like, that's a, that's a really pretty BMW design. You know, so. I, I think you can see it in the, the reflection over my, who is this uh, guy uh, in the green, in the green shirt? <laughs> that's, that's, that, I was wondering that, that as that's well. That's Roland from, that, that is Roland Hildebrandt from Motor One Germany. Uh, for, oh, the, for the okay. readers that don't know, oh, Euro- European journalists on the whole love having their pictures taken with the cars. Okay, it's, it's, um, he it's does that with all become, of the galleries that he does. I'd never, yeah. I'd never seen him before. Okay, it's almost, <laughs> it's almost become a meme. Like every time I right. see, like, do a drive program with like European media or something like that, they're all getting their picture taken with the car. <laughs> I, I don't understand it. I, I will never understand it. I, I, I apologize. You all have to see me now. I don't want to voice that on anyone. So, <laughs> Roland's a lovely guy. Really, Roland is awesome. Good. I yeah, love yeah. Roland. But yeah. but I didn't I didn't expect that would be your answer. That's really funny. Um, <laughs> but no, what what I was going to say is like, and you can see it in the reflection on on my poster over uh, right here. Is I have it's okay. Uh, Zoom in everybody. the screen, man. Yeah, I, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what I'm doing. Press the share the plus <laughs> um, the share button. Well, then, no, what, what, I, I have because we, we got to try to move on. I have a, a, I have okay. a high yeah, yeah, yeah. three quarter of the seven series up i i actually see in the front end especially a little bit of rolls royce ghost i'm not For like sure, bmw does not badge engineer cars but like if you look at it from the firewall forward it's go a little bit left a couple images left if you don't mind yeah, i can i can see what you're i can see like, what you're on about there's baby. there's a degree of of like dash to axle and like firewall forward like there's there's some rolls royce ghosts going on and that's not the worst thing in the world um, I think it's just a very specific kind of statement. So the longer I look at this, I, it's not just the black car anymore. It's even this one. I just, it's the super chiseled crisp lines. Mm-hmm. I like this car. Like it I is, like the looks of it. It is growing but, on me and everybody that listens knows I've been a little critical of BMW over the years. So I'm a little surprised by this as well. I have Maybe so. I mean, maybe oh. maybe it's going to go somewhere. Let's let's rattle off some stats really quick. And uh, exactly, and I want to do. Yeah. Design is subjective, but let's get down to some brass tacks here. So there will be three powertrains available at launch. You'll have the 740i that's with a turbocharged three light three liter inline six, making 375 horsepower, 383 pound feet of torque. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that that powertrain it now has 48 volt mild hybrid assist. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also the 760i X Drive. That is a 4.4 liter turbocharged V8, again, with mild hybrid assist. That gets you 536 horsepower, 553 pound-feet of torque. And then the really special, interesting, the new addition to the lineup is the i7, which they are badging as the i7 xDrive 60. That has the equivalent of 536 horsepower, 549 pound-feet of torque. You get a 101.7 kilowatt hour battery. Um, and what range range for the U.S. is estimated to be around 300 miles. We don't have a firm number yet. Yeah, that's that's so. just an estimate at this point. Um, it fast charges at 195 kilowatts. It can get 80 miles in 10 minutes. It's low. It, it, yeah. It, it, yeah, that's it that was a little segment. surprising to me. That that was a little bit low for the segment. Um, they do give you three years of free charging through Electrify America. So if it's going to take well, a little I'll, bit longer, at least you're not going to pay for it, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll say this, and I'm, I'm I'm somewhat talking out of my ass here because I haven't really done a lot of research on this, but there's there are always compromises in when you design a car to accept both gas or combustion engines and mm-hmm. electrification. I doubt this thing has an 800 volt architecture. Mm-hmm. Uh, Seth, correct me if I'm wrong, but no. if it if it doesn't, 195 kilowatts is 
damn fast for a hundred four hundred volt car. Um, I, yeah, I will say like there was a lot of conversation about that in the early going, like when we were at the event too, and they were not. Um, uh, we didn't have any digital materials, frankly, when we were there, we're sort of taught, we heard the presentation, we're taking notes and we're talking about it. Right. But like things like that, that you're talking about, Brandon, like the, uh, building this car to accept like both, uh, you know, ice power trains and battery electric. Um, the weird thing, the thing that was blowing the minds of, so I was there with Tom Malagny, uh, from inside EVs, who's, who's been around EVs for, since they've existed basically mm-hmm. and a bunch of other guys, they were really like, um pressing on why the the i7 doesn't have a frunk for instance like what is it in the build of this car like you would think there's a space that where a large engine should go in the in the ice version uh that's wide open for storage and it's not there right so like the way that they build it is um not ideal for i would say i think that's fair for an ev i'm not saying that it will be a bad ev by any stretch of the imagination it could be quite impressive in fact i'm a, pretty positive it'll be impressive in one way or the other but they're absolutely not doing the kind of tesla thing where they're maximizing the platform um or the vehicle specifically to be a world-class electric vehicle well you know what and the thing is they don't they don't necessarily need to like especially related to the frunk thing the eqs doesn't have a frunk either you can't even open the hood on an eqs sure so i'm i'm sure they looked at that and said well, why the hell would we spend the the budget engineering this? And I got to imagine it'd be a huge engineering job to to retrofit a frunk to an EV version of a gas powered vehicle um, when our biggest competitor isn't doing it. Yeah, agreed. That, 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 that's a good argument. Before we move on, can we just talk for a just a second, just a quick second, about the eight K thirty one inch screen that's in the back seat of this thing? That's I mean, massive. it's basically it's a movie screen in the back seat. I mean, what, is- what 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 are what are your takes on that, really quick? Because I mean, it's I guess it's neat from a from a standpoint of it's a thirty one inch screen. Right. What what practical application does that have in a car, even in the back seat? I mean, it's I mean, certainly listen, entertaining. Like it's you know, it's a yeah. selling point. We're talking about it. Also, I'm pretty sure the first TV I ever had, like when I was a kid, was 12 <laughs> or 14 inches. And so, th- it's just amazing that you can get a 31 inch screen in a car. And yeah, you're right. To my knowledge, 8K like 8K movies, 8K entertainment doesn't really exist in a mass produced way yet. I mean, the cameras are there, but no one's really releasing it. But it's still, it's going to look cool. I think I that's mean, what the, the selling point is. Gonna is gonna this gonna cool. come? Is this gonna come with barf bags? Because people trying to watch this screen while you're going down the road, I no, I I it's neat, but I don't know. I think it's kind of I think it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, my my con, my concern is is more practical than that. I've I've had this concern uh, for a few years now. Is you know, you look at the pace that that the auto industry is is improving, and you look at the amount of software that is being crammed into cars. And you have to wonder, like, how long are these automakers going to support this technology? How long are they going to push out software updates? How long are they going to offer the telematics information? What happens when they move on to the next big thing? And so for someone buying this car, you know, the third owner that is just looking like, I really love this this design. I want this. What kind of like ownership experience are they going to be in for? Because they may be living in a world where they just don't have manufacturer support for all this crazy technology in the cars. Well, I mean, I, I'll tell you, I know exactly how, how BMW and PR would answer this right now. Right. Because they made a big point. In fact, like um, I've considered may, we might still be working up a small story about this. Right. But the, the BMW team made a really big point of saying that they now have the largest fleet of over the air updatable cars on the road. Right. So my mind that that struck me because in my mind that that crown goes to Tesla, but apparently BMW has numbers that say otherwise. So I think that what they would say is that we are future proofing the cars just in the same way that, that Tesla would say the same thing. You look at a Model S when was Model S launched, right? Like you can still theoretically have a lot of the coolest, newest um, everything really that can be updated with software because you can do it OTA. So but there, I, there I, is I, there is a sunset on this development. Is sure, the thing. of course, yeah, uh, yeah, so, totally. I mean, they're also like asking you to pay a subscription for everything involved. I think I'm more interested in that, right? So they're looking yeah. at cars as things that that original owners, quote unquote, 
are uh, like taking possession of for a much shorter period of time and then moving on to something else. So it's, it's much more lease based subscription based shorter period of time. Wow. People right away. Bruce is going to buy it because it's got a TV bigger than one that <laughs> the one that he had in his room when he was 10 years old. Right. And yeah. I'm sure it's amazing. Like, well, I'm just going to wait for 15 years when this is going for like, yeah. you know, six grand because it cost a hundred grand to fix and then <laughs> just put some big wheels and tires on it and turn it into an overlander. Or Love just it. park it in the Love garage it. and just watch the 8K display. <laughs> That's right. Just yeah. turn it into a home theater. Yeah. Video, Guys, uh, we need to we, we need to jump onto some other cars know, here. We're probably gonna have to yeah, yeah. we're probably gonna have to triage this a little bit. What do we want to talk about next? Lexus RZ, Mercedes EQS, Ferrari. Do you want to talk about the Ferrari really quick? That should be a pretty quick one. Let's hit Ferrari real quick because it's basically it's uh, so the Ferrari 296 GTS debuted this week. Um it is essentially the 296 GTB, except it's a convertible. Um, and it actually doesn't, I would love to see a video and I haven't seen one yet of the roof in operation because it is a convertible. The roof goes down in 14 seconds, but when you look at it in the images, it appears to just have a removable kind of hard top thing. So I would be, I don't know if it's like a Porsche, the modern Porsche Targa thing where the whole rear clamshell comes up and it goes in there. I haven't seen a video yet. So I'd be very curious to see such a thing. Um, yeah, I mean, they designed it so, okay, you can still look into the uh, into the engine bay and see the wonderful engine back there, which still makes 663 horsepower on its own. But then when you pair it with the electric motor, it's 830 horsepower. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a screaming fast Ferrari with no roof. I, I, is there much more we need to say about it? I, after looking at the BMW, this is kind of like a ah, moment, right? Incredibly impressive. Um, most likely I'll never drive one. I think the answer to the roof is I do think it fits under that, that entire, like, uh, I think that entire like rear right behind the driver clamshell mm -hmm. comes up. And yeah. I goes, assume goes in there. I just want to see it happen. I want to see the Me origami too. make it fit. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I think it's, I think it's incredibly cool that they're, that they're melding sort of a, a six cylinder with this uh, hybrid assist. And I think it's going to be, you know, all of everything for anyone who wants to drive fast. So I also Great. wish they would give us like real photos and not these I, like super, super retouched kind of rendering yeah. looking photos auto, of the thing, but auto automakers, like as a general rule, and there are, there are a few that are, that are worse about this than others. I'm, I'm thinking of one that's not far down the road for me here in Detroit. Uh, yeah. You can take a guess at who that is. Uh, <laughs> these kind of photos are terrible. Give us real world photos. Awful. Yeah. Give us real world photos, one color, one trim, fifty or sixty of them, please. Well, there are you lots know what, of amazingly Brandon? talented got photographers out there. Yeah. Yep. So let's hit uh, Mercedes Benz EQS SUV real quick, um, which, as its name implies, it is the SUV version of the Mercedes Benz EQS. Mm -hmm. They share the same uh, platform, but if you go with the SUV version, you can, as an option, you can get a third row of seats. And that image we're looking at now, you can see it there in the back. Um, so you can get five or seven seat variants. Um, yeah, cool, big kind of family ish luxury EV. Um, they made a tweak to the powertrain that I'm trying to find. Um, fan we've got the, there, Smith. Well, I know we've we've got the 450, right? The yep. uh, the 450 that's uh, available single motor or dual motor as an option. 355 horsepower on that. There's the 580, which is standard dual motor. That's got 536 horsepower. And isn't it interesting that the EQS SUV and the BMW have the exact same amount of power? I'm just, now, I'm, I'm just now realizing that, and I'm hoping I didn't write my notes down looking at BMW <laughs> instead of Mercedes on that. Um, they're advertising 373 mile range, which I think is pretty good, but that's in the uh, in the which European that's cycle. That's WLTP, which yep. is generally a bit higher, it's, but it's, even it's generally a bit aggressive. Um, but it's got 200 kilowatt charging, goes from 10 to 80 mile range in 31 minutes. Uh, I, I mean, that's kind of the crux of the performance. Looks wise, I, I mean, we know Mercedes is, I mean, with, with their EQ vehicles, they're definitely differentiating them from their standard internal combustion vehicles. I mean, I don't think it looks bad. I just don't know that it grabs the attention that maybe it should be an EQ. I think, I think the, the, the inherent design traits of, of the EQ line, if you look at the EQS and to a lesser extent the EQE, um, I think this is the best execution of them. I think a two box oh, really? shape. Okay. I think the two box shape of the EQS SUV really 
really benefits the design language. Um, you're able to kind of hide that like swooping rear, uh, swooping rear window a lot better. Um, I think it's got a great stance like that image, both of these images that you're showing right now, like it, it looks really good. I think the proportions are more natural. The EQS especially is always looked a little bit cumbersome to me and I don't really get that here. Um, yeah, I, I, I dig it. I, I think the hyper screen is cool, but dumb, especially after seeing the uh, non hyper screen dashes in the EQE, which Brett Evans talked about in his first drive of that. Um, yeah, it's I, I, I dig it. I'm, I'm super excited to drive it. Super, super excited to drive it. All all SUVs look the same, basically. Yeah. So, basically. so all right. Kind of. <laughs> Cool. Uh, this is the one everybody's going to buy, right? Like if you own an EQS or, or sorry, if you own an EQ series Mercedes in the first generation, there's going to be a giant chance that you own this car. Is that, mm -hmm. is that fair to say? Am I, am I talking oh, yeah. my ass there? No, no, no. no. They're, no they'll, get the, they'll, get, yeah. they'll get the EQE SUV. This is going to be too expensive. Oh, EQE, fair, fair, fair. EQE yeah. SUVs okay. will be friggin' everywhere in the yep. next two years. Yeah. I mean, I think it looks cool. I think Mercedes is just killing it with interiors. I haven't driven a car with a hyper screen yet. I've got to get one of those to understand it. But I, I, I recognize like that, what you're saying. It, it's probably like, you know, like flashbang, uh, impressing a ton of people. Will it's sell a, a statement cars. piece. It's a statement yeah. piece. Does it, does it matter day to day? Probably no. not. Right. No. But cool. But what? I mean, like great that they're, I think, I think Mercedes is coming to market with a very cohesive, really interesting well realized segment they don't even have a product right they they have they have nailed the segment and i think that there's a strong case to be made that they might be the rabbit that everybody else is chasing right now in terms of luxury ev with what they're doing so um totally i will fair. say that yeah like, I mean, massive the, the, kudos the, to them the and even from a technical standpoint the cars have the range they have the charging capacity the ability to fast charge at at i want to say shit i can't remember um i mean they're they're up there they're well past 250 kilowatts for dc right. fast yeah. charging um and they're brilliant to drive i mean i've i've driven the eqs 450 and the amg and both of them are fantastic to drive yeah and I don't think it's too much of a speculation to think that there's going to be an AMG version of the EQS SUV since there's already an AMG. No, there absolutely will be. There absolutely will be. That's not the, the, they Mercedes Mercedes thing is AMG all the things. I mean, right. there there will be there will be <laughs> an, a segment a, a, for everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There there will unquestionably be an EQS SUV AMG, which is just too many damn alpha <laughs> alphanumerics. Too many yeah. three letter um, uh, groups. Yeah, I mean, you've got you've got a third of the alphabet in there. So, some some old some old car guy in his porch will have a stroke trying to like read it or say it. <laughs> we're, we're positive of that, um, but but no, like it does feel very uh, feels again. I have to get it. I've driven any of these yet, but like from from an outside, like you know, everybody, uh, probably most people watching, like uh, I'm I'm incredibly impressed with what they're what they're showing us right now. So. So from one electric crossover to another, we got to see the Lexus RZ450e. Uh, this is the sibling. It rides on the same platform as Smith Oof. and I's favorite whipping boy, just because of its name, the Toyota BZ4X. The BZ4X. Which you think sounds I, I, like I a wanna... robot from Star Wars. It, it, it sounds wrong. like a stormtrooper totally. designation. What, Brandon Brad right. backed me up well, on this. No, one, of, one of our... One of our... A, a mutual friend of of Seth and I, who works at another publication, I'll leave him nameless. Asked the question at the debut of the BZ4X, uh, "Why did you name it after a copy machine?" <laughs> <laughs> that works. And too. I, I want the I want the record to show that I asked him that, and then he asked Toyota in front of a group, <laughs> huge group of journalists. Well done. Um, well done. But yeah, I, the B, BZ4X is fine. The name's terrible. I actually really like this. I think this is a two-tone design done right. I love the black hood. I, I love that that it's it's black from nose to tail on the on the top, you know, third. I think that's great. I Real quick, it, the it, other it, member of this family is the Subaru Saltera. Um, all yep. three follow have the same platform. Mm -hmm. The BC4X has slightly different styling, whereas it 
it's as close to a rebadge as to not quite be able to call it that between the BZ4X and the Solterra. This one actually has some design changes. Actually, I'm I'm ashamed to say I'm I'm looking at this for the first time. I really dig it. This might be my favorite Lexus design in several several years. Guys, I, you know what? I, I like it. I don't know. Guys, <laughs> guys. I, I like it. I think it looks great. I I love that color too. That that matte. Look rose. at that. Hold on. Yeah. Freeze there. That's wait, that. wait, wait, that's wait, wait. that's okay. bad. That's well. bad. Yeah. Go. The wheel well is bad. Yep. Well, just just lower it a little like, bit. I but could, I, I, I gotta fit, say, I could fit my head between the tire and the wheel arch. I, I got to yeah. say, and this is starting to worry me a little bit um, because listeners will also be familiar of my general hatred of Lexus and their their big spindly grill. But I kind of like this, too. Damn it, Brandon. Well, what, wait one what, second. What, we got to talk about the yoke. The yoke, the yoke can burn and die in a fire. I hate the, the yoke. Kill you. Yeah, the, the, the yoke. Tesla, that only works. What you do to us? And automakers, why are you? Did you think that was a good idea? Well, well, hold on, hold on. Let's not blame Tesla, okay? Tesla no, was just let's, ripping let's. off. No, Tesla was just ripping off Knight Rider. Okay. <laughs> because because Tesla, hey, we so have Michael our car. Knight we have our car that's ire. stealth driving now, so it's gonna have a. I'm just waiting for Anthony Daniels to to get on board with Tesla, and all of a sudden, Kit's gonna start talking to you, right? Yeah, I, um, the, the the yoke. I mean. I, I hate to say, don't reinvent the wheel. Anthony Daniels was C3PO, not... Yeah, Anthony Daniels was not Mr. Feeny from uh, Mr. Boy Feeny, Meets yeah, World Feeny is was Knight Rider. Feeny. Wait, wait. <laughs> Feeny. Anthony, no, it was it was Anthony, somebody that was a, that was voicing Kit for Knight Rider, wasn't it? No, it was the guy that played Mr. Feeny. Yeah. I'm All right, we'll, we'll have to Anthony look Daniels it up and put it in the article. Uh, yes, any, anyways. Loke, Loke. The yoke in the Lexus. William Daniels. That's why okay. you're there. William there you Daniels. I, I was like 50% yeah. right, guys. Yeah, you got it the It wouldn't be a podcast if I got something really wrong. The Billy yoke Daniels. in the Lexus. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gimmicky, gimmicky, gimmicky. I I've, I've never, like, what's I mean, I've, I've never driven one. I guess, I mean, it's you're going to get better visibility of the instrument cluster because at some point, all of us have had some visibility issues. Okay, the wheel is. And yet it has a hard. HUD. Yeah, well, cool. yeah, which you can yeah, see but, better now from any from any seating position. Hey, how about this? The yoke makes you put your hands where your hands are supposed to go on the wheel. Number one, number okay. two, number two. You don't need the top part of the wheel unless you're a friggin' rally driver, right? <laughs> like, what are you doing in this car? Like, are you but, sorry? No, you going but, to hand over hand? No, no, you're right. But here's the thing: the one time where you do need it for an emergency situation. For, for an emergency situation, if something happens and you're trying to make some quick corrections, the one time you will need it, it won't be there. My, my question with the yoke is how Don't fast is the steering ratio? ratio? How fast is the steering ratio to make up for the fact that you, you have 50% of the steering wheel to, to grab? I mean, grip. the steering ratio isn't a result of the diameter of the wheel. <laughs> right. But what I'm saying is the steering, you know, the ratio is angle of steering input to angle of wheel turn. And yeah. How fast does it have to be if you only it can only turn it like this? I mean, you can only I'm, turn it 180 degrees. I, I'm just I'm just being a, a pain in the ass right now. I I don't think that I would actually <laughs> like the oak driving it either. But I don't actually see like there's no we're talking about it like there might be like a real functional problem for who is the like you know we're talking about an average Lexus driver too. There, we're not there won't be performance driving implications in no. this like. Nope. Sure. You know, yeah, but Seth, we need to we need to stop this before the next Corvette has a yoke. Like, we need to come out strong. That would make sense. That would make no, sense. no, oh, no, it totally yeah, wouldn't no. make sense. No, that would make more sense to me. Yes, I, actually, Corvette yoke, I think, would be uh, C9 Corvette with a yoke. I'm all in on oh, it. Let's do oh, it. Damn it, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, so real quick, um, just power specs for this. So, uh, Lexus is calling it the RZ450E. It makes a total system output of 300 horse, 308 horsepower. Sorry, you've got an electric motor at the front axle, electric motor at the back, at back axle. What makes that interesting though is that the all wheel drive versions of the BZ4X and Solterra only have 215 total system horsepower. So, mm -hmm. you're getting a power bump there. Estimated range for estimated range right now is 225 miles from a 71.4 kilowatt hour battery pack. Again, we're not going to know for certain until the EPA tests it, but they're thinking 225 miles. How big is this thing? Can somebody tell me? I've still, I've yet to. It's BZ4X size. So it's, it's. I know, but what does that Ford. mean? 
I think it's like Graf four. four smaller than yeah. Highlander. Yeah. I think it's real awkward, you guys. I, I actually think this might be the worst design language on this platform that I've, that I've seen so far. Some cool paint. I've always been a huge fan of Lexus paint. The wheels are weird. The arches are weird. The front end is real pinched. And the, the, arch, the arches should be body color. The stance feels like it's going at a crazy angle front to rear. Um, my, I don't my know. Bi- this is my bigger concern follow. is my bigger concern, and this this extends to the BZ4X and the Solterra. Is here is and John Volker, who you know I have tremendous respect for, like one of the best EV journalists in the game, covered the BZ4X for us, and he made some great points. I'm really concerned about the lack of range, which is saying mm-hmm. something because I I think range is kind of irrelevant. In the mm-hmm. grand scheme, but the lack of range in a new product being rolled out in 2022 is kind of unacceptable, and the DC fast charging is not especially great. Yep. And that's that's a worrying combination when both of those things are lagging behind. Uh, you look at Ionic Five, you look at uh, uh, Genesis GV60, which I'm going to drive next week. Like those are both in terms of range and charging speed, where the industry needs to be, the legacy automakers need to be. And it's worrying that one of the largest, or are they the largest? Is Toyota the biggest now? I I can't yes, remember. They, as mm-hmm. of last year, yeah. they were. Yeah, they're they're the yeah. largest automaker on the planet, and this is this is what they roll out. Yeah, you know, it, spend, it, a, spend all your Toyota bucks in the next five years on on uh, some sort of Gazoo product. Is oh the yeah, answer. yeah. Get yourself a GR Corolla. You'll be thrilled. Yeah. It's gonna be amazing. But well, I'm gonna try. So I want. <laughs> I might be as I'm well. A, I'm, Seth, I'm I wanted try. to give you one last opportunity to finish us out here before we move on to our other topic because you got to check out the ID Buzz. And Brandon, you've also got to check out the ID Buzz. Smith and I are orphans, but you got to see the ID Buzz at the New York Auto Show. And it just so happened today, uh, we got some spy shots of the long wheelbase version testing. So, kind of, oh, we did. Mm. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. I missed those. Wow. Yeah, I completely missed those. Zero, too. man. Very Euro van in that white out. Well, white I mean, it's yeah. a test mule, but it's still the long wheelbase. Um, so mm-hmm. tell us about, talk to us about ID Buzz. What did you think of it? Getting up and uh, close and personal. Brandon, Brandon knows more than me. I got an, I got a great walk around. I was in New York with Volkswagen. It was the, it's a thing. And I, the, the, what I really want to say is like, if you do have a chance still to go to the show, I think um, go check out the Volkswagen stand. I think it's an incredibly impressive product very cool i've had more conversations with real people about the id buzz than i would have ever expected in the last couple of weeks um because i think that it it sort of touches a nerve culturally a lot of people understand like obviously uh volkswagen buses micro buses right like they like it resonates with people um practically speaking for me again um if you guys aren't watching or you haven't seen you know me do a video before i'm a giant man it's a car that like will accommodate all kinds of people very well right i had maybe four or five inches of headroom when i sat in it um it's got all kinds of space and we were in the short wheelbase like euro version of it too right so i think that it's going to be an incredibly practical thing that people who especially uh you know folks who tend to love cars always like vans or small vans because they're so practical um the eviness of it i think won't be particularly overwhelmingly good but i think honestly i kind of think when you combine the the retro vibes, the packaging, the general practicality of of the the EV part of it, I think that you're going to get a product that resonates with a lot of people as a second car, for instance. So, well, I I think this is, and with respect for the electric mini, I think this is the first proper lifestyle EV. Sure, yep. um, I'll agree with I've, that. I yeah, I've 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 driven Tesla I've driven Roadster. A, well, you, I mean first yeah. good one um <laughs> i've I, i've driven a 67 bus i've driven the last euro van that was sold in the u.s i have a ton of experience with it the the vibes that i got from from sitting in this and crawling around this i was at i did a video shoot with it in hamburg germany back in february which feels like nine million years ago um it, it it's it's uncanny how much it reminds me of both of those products you know the 67 especially uh the, the the upright seating position the amount of space that you have in the cabin the short overhangs it's it it's so well done as like a tribute vehicle and to the mm-hmm. point that like 
and like all good lifestyle vehicles, you're able to over. I think people will be able to overlook the shortcomings as an EV and enjoy the lifestyle aspects that it mm-hmm. promises. I, I have the the spy shots of the the long wheelbase. I, if I recall correctly, the the long wheelbase is only about three inches longer than, than the short yeah. wheelbase, so that's negligible. Um, I I don't think American consumers are losing anything. We're not, you know. It's going to look just as interesting. Um, it's going to be a little bit roomier. I, I think it's going to be great. I, I hope it does well for Volkswagen. I I really like the ID4. I think the ID3 looks fantastic. I think this is the vehicle that they need. I think that the industry is waiting for a proper lifestyle product that people buy not because it's an EV, but because it looks cool and it brings something unique to the table and makes a statement other than I care about the environment. Mm-hmm. No, I I agree. And I've heard just actually just quite a bit of chatter on the interwebs um, where people aren't sure that it's going to be a good seller. And I really hope that they're wrong. Um, I like the retroness of this. I think it's a really good fit for Volkswagen people that are looking for a new family vehicle that don't necessarily want an SUV, that don't necessarily want, um, you know, a sedan. And I think it could bring in people from outside the Volkswagen community as well because it has that retro vibe. And I agree, Brandon, I think this will win, not because it's an EV, but because it's a, it's just a cool, cool, it's it's just a, it's just a cool van. Right. I mean, I mean the, the original bus people, they weren't buying it because it had some fantastic engine, right? I mean, yeah. you know, zero to 60. No, was, I, I like, could, was, I could get like, mine no. over 65 miles an hour. <laughs> right. So, uh, I mean, that, in this instance, I think the powertrain takes a back seat, but I tend to think maybe people are trying to put it in the front seat. It's a great lifestyle vehicle. I'm really jealous that both of you guys have had a chance to see it. I really want to see it in person. I really want to, to see what it's like behind the wheel. Totally. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll go on record as saying alongside GR Corolla, that's probably the, the vehicle I'm most excited to drive in the next year or so. I, I'm super, super excited for to drive ID Buzz. I think it's going to be great. And I would, to your, to your sales point, I don't know, like we're in such a weird market right now, but I would put a month's paycheck on the fact that when it goes on sale in the U.S. that this is a wait list, sold out car oh, yep, for absolutely. six months. For sure. Yeah. Because I think there's a lot of pent up demand for stuff. And I think this is going to be very high profile. Again, when my, when the, whatever, when, when strangers that I don't know particularly well and find out that I write about cars, like are asking me specifically about this and they know the name of it, like that's a, a real indicator that it's got yeah. um, some, some, some early buzz, if you'll pardon the pun. Oh, look at you. I know. I know. Sorry. Put a dollar, put even... a dollar in the, put a dollar in the pun jar. Ah, damn it. So wait, there's a pun it. jar. I, I'm, <laughs> I just, I just I'm like this. seriously in debt here, guys. Yeah, Adrian's our our coworker. Adrian has been ever since he's become a father. He has become the king of the pun. He is the king of the dad joke more more or less recently. So he he's got some euros to put in there. Um, well, uh, wanted to read one comment real quick from last okay. week before we transition and let Brandon talk. Oh, Smith, do you have something to say real quick? No, I was just going to try to do some witty pun transition that was going to fail. So <laughs> please okay. save me from well, that. I'm going to stop you from doing that. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> so uh, um, our com- frequent commenter, he's commented in the past, Harf of Jar, who I've com- been confused by his username before, <laughs> but he wrote um, kind of our longest comment that we got last week. So that's why I'm reading this one. And uh, last week we talked about the X7 facelift, um, which also debuted at the New York Auto Show, which if you're curious, that's why we didn't talk about it. If you're curious about our thoughts on the X7, go back to last week and you can hear mm-hmm. all about it. So here's what Harf of Jar has to say. I don't mind how the X7 facelift looks, to be honest. It's certainly an improvement over the pre-facelift, which looked like a scaled up X5 with not so great proportions. Um, I think the shock of the XM concept has softened the blow of the reaction to the design of this one. Agreed that it definitely looks better uh, with when you dechrome the trim and darker colors rather than the chintzy look of the non-M Sport cars. Love the show, guys. Keep it up and a f- flexing emoji. So, flexing emoji. Apparently, apparently, harf jar is some sort of Arabic um, preposition, according to what the internet says right away. So, okay, well, I'm very everything the internet says is true. 
Sure. But Brandon, <laughs> now it's your time to shine, man. Cause you went out to California. It was almost a month ago now, right? Is it a month, yeah. three weeks? Yeah. It, it's, if, February it's, is, if February is 9 million years ago, this is only about 4 million years ago. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no. So we we set up. A, it's going to be a really interesting comparison. We did a drag race component on a on a dried out lake bed with the Jeep Wrangler 392, uh, the Land Rover Defender V8, and the Mercedes AMG G63. And the general idea is that you know these are kind of the last three of the proper like ultra high performance V8 powered off road SUVs and. So we did, we did a comparison, but we also did a drag race. And it, it was interesting to me because there are three radically different price points. You know, the, the Jeep is about 80 grand. The, the Defender that we drove is was 112 and the Mercedes was $186,000. So, like, you're not going to see a huge overlap in terms of consumers. But, like, as the last of the breed, it was a really interesting exercise to see how each one shaped up off road in a straight line on public roads. Uh, we drove the things from Los Angeles to a dry, a, a place that has the most confusing name in the world. It's called soggy dry lake bed. Um, <laughs> That's I, an oxymoron. <laughs> soggy I, yeah. dry has, a, has opposed to so, soggy, soggy dry lake. Um, yeah, let's, and, let's cut and, that because I think we're supposed to keep that under wraps as our secret place we? to test off-road SUVs, but that's oh, okay. All right, well, <laughs> no, no. I, I, I'm, I'm Calif- being... California's in a drought right now. They're spoiled for dry lake beds. That's um, right. Yeah, we could have been anywhere. Yeah, that was been. one of twenty different locations we exactly uh, checked exactly. Out the internet. Yeah, and you know we we stuck them together. We measured out a quarter mile and we let her rip. And you know it was it was a lot of fun. Um, it was interesting to see how three different automakers are are approaching this kind of dying breed of vehicles and all of them are extremely capable off-road they're they're crazy fast um you know i was i don't know how much i can give away when it, when is this airing <laughs> so we will be going up sh- just after um the it goes the video goes live so oh, you brilliant. can say anything okay. you yeah. want yeah, yeah. yeah, the, yeah. The, the set the video is live Friday, Friday, Friday at, yep. 10 Friday at 10 a.m. Friday at 10 a.m. And we're going to go up basically at 10 1 a.m. So perfect. Well, so let yeah. her rip, man, because I, because so, I, I especially want to hear about your commentary. Um, Brett and Clint, they, they, it seemed like they were kind of, oh, yeah, well, we're going to do this with, and you're just like, yeah, I'm in the Jeep. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what? I, I had, to, I, had to, I had to embrace my inner Michigander for this one. Yeah. I, I, I insisted that I pick up the the Defender V8 from the airport and drive it out there because I'm I'm a huge Defender fan and you know a, a two door D90 with with 500 horsepower from that that fantastic engine really appeals to me. Um, but when I came to the race, I I had to get into the Jeep. You know I'm I'm you know four miles outside Detroit and um, yeah, it's the Jeep is just a riot. I think it. It didn't win the race. Uh, anyone that watch, has watched it will know that it did not win the race. It was last. <laughs> but but if you look at it, if you look at the fact that, you know, through the quarter mile on a dried lake bed, it was clipping 100 miles an hour. It it finished just a little bit before or behind the other cars. But it was $80,000. I mean, it was it was thirty thousand dollars less than the Range Rover. It was a hundred thousand dollars less than the G Wagon, and it was almost as fast in the quarter. It was arguably the most capable off road, especially in like slow, rocky terrain. Uh, it's just it's an absolute feat. I, I'm thrilled that it exists. Um, the Defender was. I'm I'm tempering this a little bit. I was I was unmoved by the Defender. Um, yeah. It, 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 I was hoping for like an SVR experience where it's, you know, really wild, like all the exhaust noise and crazy fast and, and barely controllable. And it was just, it's more just a defender with a V8. Uh, it was the second quickest in the compare or in the drag race. Uh, Brett Evans was driving that. He was able to set up his own specific, you know, dry lake bed launch control <laughs> mode, which, which, which was really fun. But yeah, I mean the defender is is super cool. But the the winner was, I mean, in by a pretty significant margin, the G sixty three, which is just 
it's a masterpiece of an SUV. It's worth every single penny that Mercedes is asking for it. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm just kind of rambling at this point. I don't know if you guys have any questions specifically about it. Of course, which one questions. sounded the best? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so that's that's complicated. Um, I think <laughs> that I think that the, in the side video, pipes, the Jeep sounds the best. I don't know. Maybe it's the microphone. Agreed, yeah, in the video, the Jeep yeah. sounds the best. The the Jeep the Jeep requires no, you know. No manipulation. Like, it, yeah, it has a it has a dual mode exhaust, and you can turn the like turn the exhaust open, and it open opens up baffles in 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 there and makes it a little bit louder. Um, I think it sounds the best. I think it sounds the most natural for a V8. It's it's classic like American V8 engine. The Mercedes sounded really great. Like I said, I was underwhelmed by the Defender. It just didn't have the volume that I was hoping for. Uh, but yeah, if we're talking like purely like ear tingling, I, I, my ears were tickled every single time I ran that Jeep down the, down the quarter mile. It was, it was a friggin' hoot. So I'm curious, how about on the road? Because those, big, <laughs> uh, the Jeep specifically, because those big tires, big off-road tires, generally tires like that just make a racket when you're going down the highway, especially at speed. Yeah. How, what's it like to actually drive like a normal person on the road? Yeah. So we, the day that we filmed this, we started out at about 7 a.m., got out to the, the desert. It was about an hour from where we were staying. And we were going, I mean, we were on the, you know, shooting from about 8 a.m. until about three o'clock in the afternoon. And then for reasons I'm still not really sure of, I ended up in the Jeep to drive the three hours back to L.A. <laughs> to, to <laughs> get in my hotel and and fly out the next morning. And it was it was probably the worst decision I've made this year. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was I was I was I was exhausted by the end of it. Uh, it is extremely loud. That that V eight sounds great, but it does drone. Um, I I didn't turn off the the active exhaust because I feel like that's not okay. <laughs> so right. even though even though I was deaf by the end of it and my back was broken and my internal organs were rearranged, it was uh, it was a long drive. It was, yeah, okay. I'll just leave it at that. It was a very, very long drive. Fair. But did you get a chance to drive all three or were you purely in the Jeep? Yeah, the no. Time? I mean, I, I've I've driven all three. I, I drove, like I said, I drove the Defender from LAX to the testing site. Um, I've, I've got a ton of experience with the G63, so I didn't spend as much time in there. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, if it were my money... It's it's such a tough choice between the three. I mean, the Jeep is so uncivilized in everyday conditions, and the G wagon is so expensive that I kind of have to lead towards lean towards the Defender. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really hoping that they'll do a proper SVR version. We saw some spy would... shots of that. We think yeah, that, that yeah. might be happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. I, I think that will really split the difference well. It'll it'll match the best attributes of the G wagon with the uh, with the Jeep. Um, I, I I would argue that the the Defender was easily the most civilized on road. Um, oh, really, I would have thought it was yeah the AMG. yeah. No, the AMG. I mean, the AMG is so boxy and so upright, and the suspension is so soft that a stiff breeze, you know. It's it's not as stable as you would expect a vehicle like that to be. The Defender, though, was was like a rock. I mean, I would road trip a Defender in a heartbeat, uh, even a two door model like that. My my experience in the G wagon has always been like it's it's great. Like I mean, and of course, most people buy them and sort of like drive them in town, like in the cities, right? It's a cool car to see and be seen in, and all that kind of stuff. And like standard versus amg tunes over the years really have less to do with kind of like what you want to get out of the car and more like again what you want to say about like what you're driving but on the highway on longer trips and especially commuting in southern los angeles or southern california traffic like not the, my favorite thing to be in same thing with the jeep too i guess my question is like all of these cars are, are like super they're recreational vehicles right and they're like this weird uber strata of them and you pointed out too like i think this is uh we're in we're in kind of the last days. These are the halcyon days for like super powered, crazy off roaders. Probably, uh, certainly EVs are gonna like come in and do some of this. But um, 
I just don't know. Like the the Jeep makes the least sense to me, even though it's the cheapest. As like the one, I don't understand the person who wants the three ninety two version of the Wrangler, right? <laughs> Unless they're just like completely wanting to front. I mean, because it's such a capable the, vehicle in Rubicon spec, right? With it with. A, Honestly, I engines. I would I would if I were buying a Jeep today and I wouldn't buy a Jeep cuz I'd buy a Bronco. But if <laughs> I were buying a Jeep today, it it'd be the 2 liter. The 2 liter yeah. in, in that car is so good, sublime. Right? It's yeah. really really great. I haven't driven the diesel. I hear that's great, but I'd have the 2 liter in a heartbeat. Yeah, I mean the 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 392 is entirely pointless, but you can make the same argument about the Defender and about the G63. The G63 especially, because the standard mm -hmm. G550 is so, so good. Right. I mean, you're you're buying the AMG Tinsel at that point. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, that argument applies to all three, where it's like they don't necessarily make the most amount of sense. It's just you have money and you want to enjoy that you have money. And that's why right. you buy those vehicles. Well, I think you know, the, the G63 and and the Defender V8, I mean, yet, yes, they're ridiculously powerful. Yes, they're capable off-road. But I think they're also a little bit more build as you can, you can use these on-road and still have a lot of fun and still have an enjoyable experience. Whereas Jeep with the Rubicon, it's an insane amount of power with big off-road tires where it's not going to offer quite the same experience on road. Um, and yeah. Seth, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I, in fact, I remember when the 392 debuted, this was actually before you were back at motor one. I, I caught a tweet where you were like, Oh, I want my Wrangler to go zero to 60 in four and a half seconds. Like said, nobody ever. Right. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, so, so here, but, but maybe yeah. on a dry lake bed, it makes sense. Right. <laughs> Here's the thing. It was the, the thing that the Jeep has going for it. And we didn't do this obviously for safety reasons, you can take the doors on the roof off the Jeep. Not that specific Jeep because mm -hmm. it had the sky one touch thing, which is basically the biggest panoramic sunroof on the market. It's really, really cool. It's also really, really expensive. Um, but you take the roof and do the doors off and there's, there's always going to be a fun novel novelty to that in terms of launching it on the dry lake bed. I, I made a point of lining up in the same spot, like for each run. And by the end of it, the rain or the Range Rover, um, the Wrangler had dug like far deeper down into the lake bed than either of the others. Like tires, there was like a right? noticeable. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was totally the tires. And I'll tell you yeah. this, if that thing didn't have 35 inch mud tires on it, if it had the defender or the G wagons tires on it, I think it would have won. Honestly. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I think, it, I think it was geared down so aggressively by the tires, but it launched harder. I mean, if you watch, watch the video, and I, I haven't watched it in a, in a little while, so I don't recall exactly. But like, there are numerous cases where it's it's not just my reaction time being better or me jumping the start, which I may or may not have done. <laughs> um, it was it was getting off the line quicker. It was responding sooner. It didn't have a turbocharger that need or turbochargers that needed to spool up, uh, mm -hmm. and it had as much torque as or maybe a little no about the same amount of torque as as the defend as the defender so you know i i think the the jeep was really held back by those huge huge tires it's the lightest of the three um you know if jeep wants to do a 392 uh track hawk wrangler with with some decent rubber on there like i'm i'm on board like sign me up for that sacrilege an, an on-road devoted wrangler yeah hell that yeah Ah, that'll I mean, really rile off the purists. It's, it's wrong, I, but it's so right. Can can I just say though too, like one thing that that struck me as we were putting this together because this, like, I don't know, like the team the team brought this kind of like idea out, and it seemed like it was going to be fun. Like it seems like it was going to be an amazing video, and I've got to emphasize to everybody: you've been seeing a little bit of this. If you haven't gone back and watched the video, watch the video. It's 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 yes. one of the best videos that I've seen the motor one team put together, not just like in the, in the short period of time that I've been back, but like ever, like it's one of my favorite ones to watch. So I think it was incredibly well done. These guys went over and beyond, uh, over and beyond to do like a uh, like great piece. And it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. That being said, you know, what was really impressive to me as we put this together. Every one of these automakers has a real significant reason <laughs> to say no to this, 
right? If you're Mercedes, you say no, because like, how can we win? We're the most expensive. We're the Goliath in this challenge. If you're Jeep, you're like, how can we possibly win this drag race? We're going to, we're going to lose. Like we have the, the, the smallest amount of power and to Brandon's point, like the wrong tires, right? If you're, if you're Land Rover, like you, you know that you're sort of middle of the pack and maybe, maybe they have the best incentive to say like, there's a real reason to bring it out. It's a new product, but like, everybody has a reason to say no and yet everybody has said yes because they know the point of these vehicles is abjectly to have fun in them right they mm-hmm. only exist because there's so much fun they're so crazy they're over the top and i think brandon i mean you could say it right like they all absolutely succeed on that well, scale right yeah absolutely and i think you know a, a little bit of inside baseball you know i've I, I was out driving the new Range Rover a couple of weeks ago. I got asked by the by the Land Rover PR people about this comparison. That they, they were yeah. there's there's legitimate buy in. Like if you talk yeah. to Clint, who was just out at East Jeep Safari earlier this week, they are last last week. God, the, day, the days are it's, none, it's one just, million years it's, ago. A million it's, it's years. Twenty twenty five. Brandon, wake up. Yeah, but I mean, like the the Jeep people are legitimately invested by it. They're in, invested in it. There's there's real passion among these engineers and these product people and these marketing people about this comparison. And like Seth said, there's no good reason. Like there, you know, every single one of these automakers could have looked this like been like, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. And, but all of them were involved in it. All of them were super motivated. All of them, we didn't really talk about this much, but like we reached out to all these brands and asked them, like, Hey, what is the best way to get these vehicles off the line? What do you recommend? Right. And yeah. all of them very forthright, very much like, well, do this, 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 and this. And it was passion from the automakers, from the engineers and the PR people and the designers and all the, all the folks that are involved that we talk to. Um, I think this this drag race, the, the ability to do this, the fact that it made zero business sense for the automakers uh, – speaks to one of the best things about the industry is that people want to have fun in cars. And that extends from the the line worker all the way up to the executive who is asking, Hey, who won this silly little drag race that you guys did? Uh, That's, that's been, that's been the most intriguing thing to me about this entire, entire adventure is the amount of buy-in that we've seen from automakers who, as Seth said, had no good reason to go ahead with this besides it being really fun. Well, and I think the fact that this contest was done not on an airport runway somewhere, but on a lake bed on it in an off road setting, it makes sense for all of these vehicles to be there. I think it makes most sense for the Jeep being billed as the Rubicon that it is. And I actually have a new respect for the Rubicon seeing it out there. That's you, you were, you were the slowest Brandon. But it's, it's I, but usually, it's like, I usually am. I usually am. But no, no. But I mean, in this case, it's like it, it's still a win. It's like 100 miles an hour and a quarter mile isn't slow. It's, it's not. It, and, it was, and, it was the, just, and the crazy it was thing the, is the slowest of this group. But it just seeing it all come together. It just made sense. There aren't. I, I don't know if I've seen many videos, if any at all, featuring off roaders like this actually off road going fast. So, you know, and, the the crazy thing about it is I like I'm not gonna toot my own heart horn horn here a little bit, but you know I I kind of said like you know the Jeep is going to be the least manageable of this bunch. Like let me let me drive that one. Like let me take take the risk. And we, we eased our way up. We did a lot of practice runs. We didn't need to. It was it was flawless. It was solid as a rock. You know, going a hundred miles an hour with with dust like. I literally ate dust. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I literally ate the AMG's dust, but at no point where I was like, Oh my God, this is dangerous. Uh, I don't know what this car is going to do. It was solid as a rock. And that is a huge Testament to, to Jeep's engineers that a vehicle with solid axles and 470 horsepower and like useless drag racing, useless tires for drag racing, felt so poised and so composed at a hundred miles an hour on an uneven dusty lake bed. Like it's just like motor one in no way endorses driving a hundred miles an hour off road. No, don't, 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 don't do this. There we go. There we go. That, that's our brand in this time. Of course. <laughs> I don't know. We, that's we not me and Bruce. That's Brandon this time. 
we have insurance for just this reason. But yeah, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was, it was staggering how how composed. I mean, I would have handed this car to a sixteen year old kid and let him do the same thing and been entirely. Let's not go too. No, far I'm, I'm, Mo- Motor One no, then... does not condone handing a four hundred seventy horsepower Jeep to a sixteen year old kid. No, I mean I'm, that I'm gonna, was. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in on that one, Seth. No, it, it, you know it's 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 that <laughs> level of confidence that I had in it, um, yeah. which I, I think is a, a huge. It, yeah, it's a huge testament to how good it is, and I, I can only imagine. You know, it, it, you know, it's going to perform well in these conditions for just about anyone that has it. Obviously, be safe, use your head, but like, it's a crazy capable vehicle. Cool. Well, well, guys. Well, what one yeah. last question here, since we have these three vehicles, let's just go down the row here. You can take one of them home tomorrow. Brandon, are you choosing the Jeep? No, no. Which, which one are you choosing? Uh, probably a G550, not the G63, but probably a G550. I mean, I you got to drive the things every day. And mm-hmm. and the Jeep is too uncivilized, and the Mercedes is too expensive, and the Defender is just a little bit too mild. Uh, a standard G five fifty is is where it's at. Okay, Seth, how I'll about take you? The, I'll take the Auto Journalist cop out and pick one that's not <laughs> available. Um, I haven't. I, I'm in love with the Defender. I drove the the standard. I drove the one ten, and I love it. Defender all day long, twice on Sunday. Okay. I'm Bruce. How about you? G sixty three. G63? Yeah. I'm actually going to go with the Jeep, believe it or not. Okay. This this drag race, you know what? It's not about being first. It's about having fun. And I suspect, and maybe this is my my rally tastes coming through, but I suspect I would have more fun in the Rubicon than I would in the others. Good I think, I think the, the, the Jeep is objectively the most fun. And there you go. Solid advice. So, uh, or, or at least some fun advice. Exactly. Uh, I think it's time to wrap things up for tonight, but we got to give our guests a chance to promote themselves. So Brandon, is there anything coming up that you think you want to tell people about anything that you've recently published, any social media stuff? Just have fun, man. P- promote yourself. Uh, I, I, I'm not good at the plugging. Um, follow <laughs> me on Twitter and Instagram at Brandon Turkus on Twitter at B Turkus on Instagram. And I apologize now if you choose to take that advice. <laughs> okay <laughs> rage tweets twice a week seth do you get to promote yourself now is there anything coming up on motor one that you really like anything that it's in the recent past you really like or some sort of social media thing you want to promote go for it man please 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 go watch this video read this story oh, yeah. we haven't talked about the story brett evans wrote an amazing yes. uh written piece to go with the video we've been talking a lot about the video shoot which is great you can check that out on the site you can check it out on youtube, YouTube. Um, read the, read the story. It went up today. Uh, it's, it's incredibly well done. Uh, a lot of fun. Um, the only thing I'm working on right now that's, that's about halfway done is I'm writing a column about a road trip and an old Volkswagen Beetle. Um, that one will cool. be, I don't know when it's going to be done. It's going to be done. Brandon, tell me when I need to have it done next week. <laughs> so you, you tell me, man, you're the boss. <laughs> Seth, <laughs> Seth coming in here, making me look bad. Like actually promoting the site. I'm just like, <laughs> Please follow my brand. Please, please follow. Oh, well, no, I, yeah, you uh, at at Seth S U Y T H on on Twitter. You can follow me too. Been around forever. Uh, and like, and occasionally I'm write a lot about basketball. And occasionally Seth posts some questions that might show up in a future article. So if you want to be part of that, True. you can be part of that. And Seth also stole all of my shtick about going to read the article at motor1.com, going to motor1.com to see the drag race video, going to motor1.com to see all of the debut articles of the vehicles we talked about here today and many, many more. Going to motor1.com just for your general automotive news. But go to Motor One Podcast on YouTube to check out our podcast going back over a year now we're Mm -hmm. just cruising right along brandon seth thank you both very very much for joining us mr bruce it's been a podcast man yep yep it has uh real quick kind of house cleaning thing so right now right now we have no guests for next week but we have three scheduled for may so Mm -hmm. um yeah we'll have a and i think all all of them are new people all of them will not be returning guests they'll be newbies so um, look forward to that. So you'll get just Smith and I next week, more than likely, unless something changes. But then May, it'll be 
whole lot of guests. So look forward to that. And you, as always, email us at podcast at motor one.com. If you have any questions, comments, whatever. And other than that, good afternoon, good evening or good night. We appreciate all your feedback, all of your listens, all of just everything. We appreciate that you take the time out to listen to the show or watch the show on YouTube. So thank you for that. And with that, bye-bye.